I've been looking at this with the help of a model uh, from Frank et al. This is a, a Bayesian model of cross-situational learning. What they did was they got a, a video corpus of uh, child-parent interaction and they coded it for utterances and the objects that were present in the scene at the time. So in this case, the mother saying, here's a cat and a baby, and the objects in the scene are a cat, a baby, and a rattle. And over several instances of these pairs, the, the model learns to associate certain words with uh, particular objects. Um, and what they found was if their model preferred smaller lexicons, and if it preferred words to refer to objects that were present in the scene, their mutual exclusivity kind of falls out of the model. It's a natural result of the learning algorithm. What I was interested in was whether it would still exhibit mutual exclusivity if I gave it a bilingual input. So I got a, a bilingual co video corpus. It's difficult to find one that matches exactly because there are very few bilingual video corpora. Um, but this is one in English and Cantonese. And the mother is saying, do you want the apple and the banana? And, and a few other things. Uh, uh, what we can do now is train the, the model up on the monolingual and the bilingual corpus and then put it in this situation and see how it would behave. What does it think uh, the spiffer is? So uh, this is a graph of the results. I'm going to take you through it. Uh, if we focus on the monolingual first, so these are the blue columns, um, these are the relative probabilities of what the model thinks the word spiffer uh, relates to. So the most likely thing is uh, this, uh, the object it hasn't seen before, which that matches with the mutually exclusive uh, behavior we see in, in real children. After that, it assumes that Spiver doesn't refer to any of the objects in the scene, and then to an object it's seen, and lastly to uh, both an object it's seen and an object it hasn't seen. However, this model is a winner-take-all model, so it will always make this choice. Um, now, if we look at the bilingual corpus, it's behaving qualitatively exactly the same. There are some quantitative differences, but it's still exhibiting mutually exclusive behavior. So this isn't what we want. We wanted to see a difference and it doesn't appear to be one. Um, but perhaps this is uh, a result of the model preferring smaller lexicons. Now obviously, bilinguals have larger lexicons. Um, so what happens if we change that bias so that the model prefers um, smaller concept sets, which are more equal to monolinguals and bilinguals? Um, uh, here's what happens. The order of things change again. Uh, so now, for some reason, it prefers the, the object to pair the word that it hasn't heard with the object it hasn't heard, seen, and the object it has seen. Um, but again, although the, the bilingual corpus seems to be slightly more ambivalent, in fact, it's qualitatively exactly the same again. So this isn't something we find in the real world, but it demonstrates that, well, I think, that the, the linguistic variance alone does not account for the differences in cross-situational learning between monolinguals and bilinguals. Uh, and therefore, bilinguals and monolinguals must be using different learning strategies altogether. Now, there are lots of problems with this analysis, and what I'm working on at the moment is building a synthesized corpus um, where I can control the number of objects and the number of uh, utterances. That's still a work in progress. OK, so what we've seen, if the amount of linguistic variance affects your learning, uh, this affects the selective pressure <coughs> on language. I'm going to talk very briefly about how network dynamics <laughs> can influence this linguistic variance and how this might be a source for um, possibly an additional source for a different kind, two different kinds of uh, approaches to learning. So if you imagine these two network structures, uh, the one on the left, if you imagine the black dot is you and the white dots are your friends, and the line between them is who's talking to who, you're talking to all of your friends, and all of your friends are talking to each other. Uh, but on the right, you're talking to all of your friends, but your friends belong to two cliques who aren't talking to each other. What I'd like to argue is the the, on the structure on the left, you're more likely, it's more rational to assume that everyone's speaking the same language. Yeah, you can make that assumption because everyone's talking to everyone else. On the right, it's less um, rational to assume that, and you might, um, these two cliques might be slightly different in the, in the way they speak. This goes back to Daniel Nettle's work, uh, which showed that two communities which are um, isolated from each other their linguistic systems will diverge. Um, so that if this is true, what we expect to see would be monolingual and bilingual communities in the real world having different social structures. And I've been looking at this using Twitter, 
Uh, Twitter, if, for those of you who don't know, is a social networking site where you can post messages uh, publicly and privately, and you can follow people, uh, you can listen to people essentially, and people can follow you. And there's in publicly available information on who's following who and uh, where people live uh, in terms of <laughs> countries, nothing too scary. Um, so what I did was uh, I got a smaller number of users from about 106 countries, and I tried to predict the amount of linguistic, sorry, tried to predict the number of followers and people who follow you, people you follow, the followees, I might use that. <laughs> I have used it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you have from, I'm trying to predict how many followers and followers you have from the amount of linguistic variance in that country. I'm using two measures of linguistic variance, the Greenberg <laughs> Diversity Index, which is the probability that any two people in a country speak the same mother tongue. It's not an ideal uh, measure for bilingualism, but probably the best we've got. And also the number of languages. There are lots more things I could have used, but I'm controlling for population size of the country, the prevalence of internet connections, and the gross domestic product. Uh, and what I find is that linguistic diversity is a significant predictor of the number of people you follow and the number of people who follow you. Um, and these are, these are positive correlations. So if you live in a bilingual community, you're more likely to know more people. That's what this suggests. However, it doesn't give us the whole picture because it doesn't show us the structure of the network. I might know how many friends I have, but I don't know how they're talking to each other. So what I'm working on at the moment is building social structures for individual cities um, and also checking that people who say they're friends are actually in active communication with each other following this paper on how to construct social networks from Twitter. And preliminary results suggest that uh, people from monolingual cities do have dense social networks, um, but I'm still working on that. Um, in the wider picture, if social structures affect linguistic variance, then we might be able to infer things about the kinds of societies in which language evolved. Specifically, if we evolved to be able to handle a large amount of linguistic variance, if we evolved to be able to learn two languages very easily, um, communities might have been large and complex and clustered. Um, uh, yeah, so this, this is in line with Dunbar's theories of uh, language as a tool to construct and maintain social relationships in a complex community. So the, the complex community is sort of driving force for, for language. And I'm going to go a step further <laughs> and suggest that bilingualism evolved before linguistic abilities, before language. This might sound like a really strange thing to think, but if we, if we see bilingualism uh, in the broad sense as the ability to respond in the same way to two different stimuli, then it's just a kind of learning algorithm that's very uh, useful. In fact, here's, here's a, a Campbell's monkey, and they make different alarm calls for different predators um, in different situations. And in fact, the Diana monkeys and the yellow casket hornbills respond appropriately to the Campbell's monkeys' alarm system. That is, they speak Campbell's. These are bilingual animals. And if uh, animals can do this, it's obviously very um, uh, advanti advantageous for the, the animals because they can use more information in their environment uh, to help them survive. Um, then this is an ability that will that should um, evolve, maintain. Well, um, to conclude, then, flexibility is a central aspect of language. And children also appear to be uh, very good at handling a lot of um, a lot, several languages at once or uh, several social situations. Um, in that case, I think bilingualism should be a more central part of uh, language evolution. And an evolutionary approach should be taken to bilingualism as well. For my two research questions, the one I'm focusing on at the moment, what does the capacity for bilingualism suggest about the selective pressures imposed on our ancestors? And what does this imply for the future of bilingualism? Are we destined for to all speak the same language, or is, mono, or is bilingualism a sort of fundamental aspect of language that caused the evolution? There are some references. Thank you very much.